If you're here for the thing where we do fun stuff with Elm and Phoenix and collaboration and music, then this is in fact that room. Uh, so before we dig in, uh, make a confession. I, I gave this talk at Elixir Conf earlier this year, and I have a, a sort of a problem. I have a lengthy history of talking about languages other than the one that a given conference is focused on. So for instance, at Ancient City Ruby, I talked about Elixir in 2014, and at Elixir Conf that year, I talked about Java, sort of. And uh, at ElixirConf last year, I talked about Angular and building your own language. So at ElixirConf this year, I talked about Elm. Um, and so we'll also cover Elixir and Phoenix too, uh, but uh, we'll spend more time on philosophy than we will focus on like difficult code on the Elixir side, but you'll see stuff. So let's talk about collaboration, like what it is. Uh, the easiest way to describe it is you have multiple parties that are working on something together. They're viewing some shared state together. Uh, in this case, we're doing collaborative music. But the fundamentals are the important thing. So uh, here, that shared state is called a thing that Alice and Bob are interacting with. But of course, it could be a document, or a game simulation, or a database tables. But realistically, probably, unless you're building a database app, they shouldn't be thinking about them as database tables. Um, uh, or yeah, in this case, it's music. So uh, that's the motivation. And I want to walk through sort of how we'll cover it. So we're going to have like a speed reading of the history and the fundamentals of collaboration on the web. Uh, we already talked about how it's fundamentally just multiple parties working on some shared state. Uh, you'll note that that sentence does not mention the word like web sockets or real time or the web um, or anything like that. So Phoenix is a framework for Elixir if you're not familiar and it gives us this uh, abstraction called channels. And people generally say channels, aha, you mean web sockets. And that's not really right. Um, so I want to kind of talk about that very briefly. Um, so the point is a lot of people said, ah, now it's easy to do collaborative stuff and it used to be hard because now we can do web sockets with channels. And the point is, uh, you don't need WebSockets for collaboration. Uh, and Phoenix channels aren't just WebSockets. There's lots of uh, transports. Um, and you don't need to be on the web to write collaborative software. And collaborative software doesn't need to be real time. And it doesn't need to do Ajaxy things at all. Um, before Ajax existed, I, had, uh, I basically had this like, zero width hidden iframe that I used for something Ajaxy. Like it was blocking, but it was blocking somewhere else. So nobody cared. So I had like a queue of them, and I just spun out messages to them and let them do things. This was way before XML HTTP requests, but it worked, and it worked roughly the same way, but only because browsers were terribly insecure. Um, anyway, so the point is it worked just fine back then. This was in, I don't know, it was like a year before the sort of Ajax uh, blog post came out. Uh, and also, normal CRUD REST interfaces are also collaboration. They involve a lot of header overhead for repetitive HTTP requests. Um, you're collaborating on a shared like database, probably, in any CRUD app, right? So CRUD is collaboration. Um, you're all changing some shared state that you can see. But you didn't traditionally have a great way to basically send updates to the client. So push out connected clients some updates about what's happened. So part of the importance of sending clients notifications uh, is sending clients notifications. That's kind of part of, part of what makes things feel like you know, real-time collaborative. Um, and what's nice is that Phoenix channels make it easy uh, to do collaboration. But they do it by providing this nice abstraction uh, that could have existed before WebSockets um, or any of sort of newer technologies. Uh, my whole point in going through all that is I wanted to just point out it's the abstraction that matters. Um, back in 1990, uh, 1998, we had TLS. We could have done HTTP streaming with TLS. And at least for one half of the communication, that exactly, has exactly the same performance characteristics as WebSockets. So, like you could have built the stuff that people are building in Phoenix now, you in theory could have built right in 1998 and mostly been okay. Um, but there weren't that many people building this sort of awesome stuff that's easy to build in Phoenix back then, and that's because there weren't great um, abstractions. We had like Comet, but not in 98. Um, anyway, so the point is the abstraction makes it possible to do lots of fun stuff, and the thing I'm doing today is one of those things. And Phoenix channels are a great abstraction over this real time communication. Um, so if you happen to be telling people why Phoenix is awesome, please don't talk about the WebSockets part. Talk about the, the channels bit, I guess. Um, so I'm going to tell you a really dumb story that uh, gives a good insight into what it means to think properly about building collaborative software, um, just so you can also see how not to do it. So we had a cus uh, I worked, I ran a consultancy for like a decade, and we had a potential customer get in touch with us because a guy we'd worked with before uh, knew, he saw them like driving off a cliff and he couldn't convince them himself, but he said, okay, well, like, just spend a few minutes talking to Josh and telling him what you're doing. And so he got the guy on the phone with me, and he said, I don't know why he tried, told me to call you, but you know, let me tell you what we're doing. Um, and it turned out that they were basically building like collaborative software, but with no abstraction around what collaboration meant, and they were gonna run into a huge problem because it turns out you have conflicts, and they weren't gonna deal with them. Um, so yeah, so he said to me on the phone, well, we have this one small bug, maybe this is what he's talking about. Um, 
So has this ever been actually an accurate statement, like in, ever, any time? There's not, there's not a small bug. Um, so at any rate, they didn't know that their problem was hairy at all. They thought we have this one tiny bug. When we're done, we can ship this thing we've worked on for six months. And I told them, no, you actually have to throw it all away. Um, so once they explained what they were doing, I realized, like, no, you've completely modeled this wrong. And like, you, they basically hired a very cheap contractors to do it, and they just got something done. Um, so they said I was being dramatic when I told them that it was never going to work the way they built it, because um, this is not a distributed system. You're, you're being a little, I mean, you're, you're being dramatic. Uh, we just have a couple of people on the internet doing stuff together. Um, but that's kind of the point. So anyway, it was uh, a couple of people that were interacting with like the shared bit of state related to like just quoting a, um, a solar panel installation like plan, right? So it was a, essentially a sales pipeline for solar panel installers. Um, it worked perfectly except for any time there were conflicts and then like who knew who won, right? And they would get out of sync and there was no real good way for them to sort of solve it. Um, but ultimately, I was able to help them get a, a solid product. But the point is, you have to think about these things. And just like we're going to use WebSockets, and collaboration is not a good way to think about them. So you have to build systems that are designed around collaboration from the get-go if you're going to have a happy time. Um, and I wrote a lot about like academic things that I'm honestly not qualified to tell people about, like Leslie Lamport and total ordering and happened before and Lamport timestamps and vector clocks and all that stuff. But uh, I, would, I would probably butcher it, uh, but I'm still glad to talk about it, uh, just not on this stage. Um, anyway, I do read about this stuff a lot. Uh, anyway, so the point is, these are like the sorts of things that you need to be thinking about when you're going to build collaborative software. And if you're not, you're going to have, you're going to run into problems. So like a really solid example is in a chat log. So the stereotypical example for Phoenix web, uh, Phoenix channels is let's build chat. And the way we do it is we have a form, we have some JavaScript and you type a thing and you press enter and it puts it on your DOM and then it sends out a message to the channel. And then anybody that receives the channel message also puts the same message on their DOM. But like, you can look at this and say, okay, well, like, there's no guarantee about the ordering being the same, like in these two browsers, uh, based on the way that's done. So um, that's problematic. So the whole point is it's, you're, you're, you should think of a chat log as like this collaborative thing. Like we have this log, and we're all collaborating on this thing. And so if we are, then it should be the same. And so if it's not the same, then in chat, you can probably get away with it for the most part, but it's still wrong. Um, anyway. So we're going to move on from there and talk about an application that I built in Elm and Phoenix, and I'll show it off in a little bit. It exists as a kind of um, introduction to doing real-time collaboration with these two amazing tools. I think both Elm and, and Elixir and Phoenix are, are really, really nice. Um, I call this thing Colluder, and you can find it on GitHub at Neuter. That's my nickname because uh, I was 14 once. I thought it was hilarious. And then uh, Colluder, um, as in collusion. All right, so it's an app that has two parts. There's the Elm piece, uh, which is the front end, and this is actually where I built the app initially. I uh, did all the data modeling, did all the planning. Uh, and then there's the Phoenix piece, which is an umbrella app, which if you don't know Phoenix, just means that it's multiple applications that kind of sit under one mega repo and work together. Um, and the Phoenix part is just a really thin shim for the Phoenix channels, which are kind of like that, that collaborative uh, abstraction, to send in messages to what's known as, as, as let me just ask, like, who here knows uh, much or much about Elixir or Erlang? Uh, who knows nothing about Elixir or Erlang? Okay, so in Elixir and Erlang, there are these things called gen servers, and they basically are like these sort of um, processes that run on their own that have, you can send the messages, and they have like some state that they can manage. And so you can represent things that live collaboratively uh, with gen servers. And so I have this gen server protocol that represents like a song, because you're all working collaboratively on the same song, so there's one actor living and you're all sending him messages, and he's talking to all of you. Um, and then the actual web piece, because that's all non-web, right? That's just software. And then there's the web piece that just like, makes it easy to send messages in and out of it, from, which is, I think, a thing that we don't do enough, uh, separation of like, the business layer from like, the web layer. And I always want to encourage people to do that, because your web interface should just like, literally just be a web interface into an application that's running. Um, anyway, so that's sort of how this ends up being modeled. I'll talk more about that later. Um, so I'm on a bit of crusade to bring these two uh, worlds together. I think they're both really amazing apart, and they're doubly amazing together. Uh, and so when I was actually getting in-depth into this project, uh, I tweeted out something that just was you know, sort of passionate about at the time that expressed how I felt pretty well. And so I said, yeah, Elm and Elm MDL, which is a material design library for Elm and Phoenix, is like the closest I've ever felt to come to having actual superpowers. Um, 
And that's just because I'd built something that going into I thought might be moderately complicated to like get exactly right, all, all the UX concerns, and then it just wasn't at all complicated and it worked first try. And that happens plenty, but in this particular case, I was concerned about it. Um, so it was like how I always dreamt programming could be, if only it weren't awful a lot of the time. Um, anyway, so I'm, I am a full-on fanboy for Elixir, Phoenix, and Elm. Uh, that's because they make my life as a programmer fantastic. Um, so if you take nothing else away from the talk, um, fiddle with one or both of these, and if you really want to go hog wild, make them work together because it's not hard, and I'll show you. Um, so I'll demo the app pretty soon now. But first I want to talk about Elm, what it is. is. Who here knows anything at all about Elm? Okay, so about half the people have seen Elm or know, know about Elm and half haven't. So I'm going to give you a high-level overview of how your Elm applications work. So this is like an Elm application in general. And so that little bit in the middle you can think of as the runtime. And you as the programmer provide basically these, these green boxes. You provide, uh, you also provide the types of what your model is, like your application's model and what your message is. Uh, your messages would be like all the things that can happen in my application. Um, so you, you have your init where you say like this is the initial state of the world. You have your update which will be handed by the runtime both any messages that come in and the current state of the model. And then you'll like return a new model and you might have those, that second bit command message is um, side effects. So like things that you want to happen in the world. Maybe you want an HTTP request to happen or something to go off a web WebSocket. And then that'll like come back into the runtime and now your model has been replaced with the new model that you spit out. And then you have the view which takes the model uh, as its argument and produces uh, something that, that HTML message is, HTML is a type that's provided in message like is the message type that you describe. So it's uh, parameterized over, that basically means it can emit the messages that you've defined. That's, that's all that means, it's just a type. So anyway, the model goes through the view function and produces some HTML that can produce messages. Um, and so that's for like when the user, this Sally here in the bottom right, does stuff. But then also stuff can happen that is not user initiated, right? So like the ticking of time or something comes in on a WebSocket, basically things that the user didn't do but still happened. Um, and those are subscriptions. So you set up subscriptions and they also produce messages. So you map. Uh, you have subscriptions that say like, hey, when stuff comes in on the WebSocket, take the raw data, like decode it this way, and then create a message that uses that decoded thing and send that into my update function. Um, anyway, so that's sort of the whole of Elm. And it may seem complicated, but in fact, it is not very complicated at all um, when you get into it. All right, so you totally understand Elm now. Uh, here is the Elm side of Colluder. Um, it's not like the most amazing thing here, but this is the Elm application that I built. Uh, uses web audio in the background. And this is not doing anything collaborative. This is just like, essentially, it produces some JavaScript that makes this interface. And you can pick notes and all that jazz. Um, so the reason that I felt like I had superpowers is because I've wanted to build something like that for a long time, but I didn't want to put any time into it. Like, it's not like it was important to my life. It was just a thing that I wanted to do because I have a lot of, uh, I have like some games that I want to build that need that as a sort of fundamental building block. Um, but like, I knew that the JavaScript part was going to be terrible um, and that I would be miserable. And the collaboration story was awful before uh, I dealt with Phoenix Channels, and I didn't really want to do it. Um, and so what I could have built, I could have built that at any time since 98, uh, but I was unwilling to go through the trouble. And since these things are awesome, I was not only willing to go through the trouble, I was excited about doing it. And I did it in about, I could have realistically done it in a few hours. I did it over a couple of days because I was kind of taking notes as I went because I produce uh, training for people. Anyway, so let's look at how the Elm app itself is built. Um, all Elm apps tend to look the same at the top level, roughly. Um, not even roughly, like almost all of them look like this or some minor, minor variant. Um, so here we've got a program. We say, hey, I'm going to produce a program. That's all that thing at the top means. So that's like telling the, the runtime how to wire stuff up. I give it my initial stuff. And so the init on the left, that, that sort of thing in parentheses is a two-tuple. So the thing on the left is my initial model. I don't think I should have necessarily called it init in this case, but, and then the second part is what are my initial like outbound messages or outbound commands rather that I want the runtime to do th for me. <coughs> then we have my update, which is just, here's the function. Once you have a message, here's the function to route it through along with my model. Then I tell it how to render the view and then I give it a list of subscriptions. And these actually are dependent on the model. You can do some neat stuff because of that. It's not too important right now though. Um, so let's talk about the model. Uh, we have some types we should talk about first. Song is a dictionary with integer keys and tracks for values. Uh, realistically, this might should be an array, but um, I didn't want to have to worry about like what happens if something like went out from under me because I, uh, uh, there's not a really good reason actually to have, to have had that concern, but the point is I, I did model it as a dictionary uh, with integer keys. 
Um, it's not broken, so I didn't want to go fix it. Uh, so this is the data structure that represents like all of the stuff that you saw in the UI, or the song part of what you saw in the UI. Uh, track is just a record. It contains a note. So like, what note do I play on this line of that uh, interface? And it also contains some slots. And those are all the things that can either be on or off. And so when the sort of playhead goes through them, if they're on, it produces the note specified. And then slots, again, is a, a dictionary with integer keys of Boolean. So like, is the slot on or not? That's all that means. Um, so then there's the model. Uh, there's a whole lot of fields at the top here, up through song, that are completely irrelevant to anything except for setting up the initial kind of music part on the JavaScript side. So we'll completely ignore them. And actually, some of those should like, not be there anyway. They just don't need to be there. But then we have like our song. We know what the current note is. And that's just like the pass through the, uh, that's where the playhead is, essentially. Uh, we have the total notes. This is a silly field that I ultimately shouldn't need. But uh, again, I haven't needed to remove it yet. So not that important. Whether or not we're paused, uh, what beats per minute we're playing at. Um, that MDL bit is just stuff that is used by the material design library that I use sort of to manage internal state. And then we have these last two bits, and I'm going to get to them a little bit in more detail later. But uh, like when you saw the modal come up where we were changing the note on a track, uh, this says, like, track being edited. You may be editing a track. If you are, it'll be an, uh, just some integer, which represents the, the key in the, in, the, in the dict for that track that you're editing. Uh, or it'll be nothing if you're not currently editing one. And then a chosen note. You know, it was like a multi-step flow. So I represented sort of that wizard as these two pieces of data kind of mixed together, which is the part that's not great. So the chosen note was like when you picked the first part of the wizard. Um, so it may be a string or maybe nothing. Um, anyway, so that's the type of the model. And this is an instance of the model. So it's just a record of that type that has reasonable starting values. Uh, so all that first bit up till song gets filled in by the JavaScript on the other side and a few things. Uh, I have an initial song. It's super basic. It's empty with two tracks. Starting point for the playhead is zero. Total notes is some number. It's not important. Uh, we are playing. We have 128 beats per minute. We have an initial material model. And then we're not editing a track, and there's no chosen note in the wizard. Um, so I pre-populate the song as just two tracks, each with a fifth octave A note and 20 false slots, right? So this is, a, if you haven't seen Elm code, this is fairly straightforward Elm code, right? Total notes is an integer. It happens to be 20. Initial song, we start out with an empty dict. We insert uh, with key 0 a track, and we insert with key 1 a track. And then a track is MIDI note 69, which is the fifth octave A. Um, those last two bits aren't terribly important because I don't let you edit them. And then uh, the track slots, OK, so I have like 0 through total notes minus 1, so I have 20 uh, of these things. And that list.foldl, right, it's just folding across that initial list and accumulating into an empty dict a new dict with that slot ID and false. So uh, that one little bit I probably could have made a little bit clearer, but I, it's not confusing to me. Um, anyway, it's kind of important to be able to do stuff to your model, and this is where updates come in. So Elm is an immutable language, because otherwise I wouldn't use it. Um, so how do you change something in an, immutable, in an immutable language? So we're not confused, right? It's the same thing as I mentioned Erlang's gen servers, or Elixir's gen servers. They they're the same situation. Elixir and Erlang are immutable languages. So like the whole trick is you have an initial state, and then when a message comes in, you produce a new thing that represents the new state, and then your function basically like wraps that and passes it on to the next piece, which is generally a loop. So you don't change anything. You just call yourself with different arguments, and then you have tail call optimization, and things are OK, and things don't blow up. Um, anyway, so just a little primer on how that works in both gen servers and Elm. Glad to talk about it in more detail later. Um, so you can think of your application as constantly folding or like reducing over incoming events through this update function using the initial model as the initial state. Um, that's all that this whole trick is. Or you can think of message as, if you know Elixir, like a gen server cast, and update is like the handle cast function. So what kind of things happen in our app? Um, this is the whole list. It's awful and big and flat and seems overwhelming if you just look at it. Uh, it's kind of a grab bag of different stuff. Uh, I'll break it out into some smaller pieces, and we'll talk about those. So this is the web audio bit. This is just some, a piece that I cribbed from an existing open source project that did the initial sort of web audio setup because I didn't want to figure it out from the get-go, and it was already done, and it seemed great. Um, so that's why I said this part wasn't terribly important because there's just some JavaScript on the other side that interacts with these updates and these messages and like, sets the stage so that you can play music nicely. Uh, it like, loads in a sound font, as one example, and starts a web audio uh, object. Um, so not hugely important, but what happens ultimately is um, we find out if we can use AUG. We go load the sound font, or we ask to load the sound fonts. We're told whether or not that worked. We ask it to play notes, et cetera. 
Um, these go over ports into the JavaScript runtime, uh, which you can, ports are like how you do interop. And um, that's sort of how this works. Uh, in Elixir, there's also ports. It's the same thing. Like, it's how you do interop with other things. Um, one really cool part of port ports is that since this is a strongly typed language, they do something that they call border control in Elm, uh, which makes sure that the data, you can't send anything across a port that the port doesn't know how to deal with. So if you have a port that says, I turn a string into messages, and you say, aha, yes, I'm going to send a one across that port, it stopped on the JavaScript side. So that's the border control, right? There's, you never, on the Elm side, have to deal with anything being like maybe not the right shape. Like if you're writing JavaScript, I can virtually guarantee you have 8 million lines in your code base that are like, well, I told people to give me an integer here, but what if they gave me an array of three nils or something stupid, right? So um, anyway, so all this stuff basically lets us make noise in the browser. Um, so we want to talk to Phoenix. Um, so we have a message that tells us, hey, I'd like you to connect the socket. Um, and then we say, hey, I got a message back, and this is managed by a, a library that I use. And then receive state says, like, here's your new state, your new model that the server gave us. Um, and it's just a JSON encoded value when we get it from JavaScript. And then we do decoding into our actual types on our side. Um, anyway, uh, I did write, there's, in, in Phoenix channels, there's also this thing called presence. Uh, so you can know who's on the same channel as you. Uh, I wrote support for it, but I don't use it here, here yet. I would expect ultimately to like be able to say these are the three people that are playing with the song with you. Okay, so the actual app that you have that's doing stuff, not the, um, the other bits we've talked about, playing music or talking to Phoenix, but the part that you know, we saw standalone uh, is this, right? So we have the ticking of time represented. Um, so like that just tells us, hey, the app ticked. Like do whatever the next step is. Um, we have check note, which just lets you pass uh, for a given track ID and slot ID, whether you want it to be on or off. Uh, we have set note, which lets you choose for, it is badly named, let you basically say this track should be a, a third octave A or a D7 or something. Um, and MIDI note is a, its own type. Uh, we have add track, which says like I'd like another line in the sort of song. Uh, we have set BPM, which is how you change the beats per minute. Uh, toggle pause turns it off or on. Uh, set editing track, choose a note, and choose octave are all three kind of combined part of that wizard that we saw. And that's a bad model. I'll talk about that further. Um, all right, so that brings us to the update function that drives all this. So can everybody read this? Again, so this is not unusual. Like in Elm, uh, it's encouraged to have these big flat update functions uh, just because in practice it's not problematic. Um, there's a lot of code here. It's not complicated to work with this code. Like I've never ever ever gone into this code base and gone like, now what does this part? Like it's really, really straightforward. Uh, so we'll walk through it in much smaller chunks because uh, legibility. Okay, so like initialize audio context just says like we send a thing out a port that says like, please make an object for me in JavaScript. And then response audio context is them telling me, oh, cool, you have one. Here it is. Um, request aug enabled. That just lets me know whether or not I should use the aug sound font or the mp3 sound font. Um, request load fonts. We tell them, like, here's where the fonts are. Please go get them. And then it tells us whether it worked or not. And then request play note says, hey, right now, like, play this note. That's it. And then there's very thin JavaScript on the other side that knows how to deal with all this. It's maybe 40 lines of code and could probably be less. Um, and then I'd get, find out whether I played the note or not. I honestly don't give a crap. Um, like, it works. So, uh, but I could care. Uh, and then toggle paused, right? All this does is takes our model, and it says, uh, like, take the paused field and set it to the opposite of what it is, right? And then that bang, empty list thing. So the re return value of this, let me go back uh, to here. So I, the, talking about syntax, because I'm sorry, uh, very, people here have not seen Elm. This is an update function that takes two arguments, message and model, and returns a third thing. And the, types, uh, the type of message is this uppercase message. Type of model is this uppercase model, and those are just things that I defined. And then it returns this two-tuple, right, the model, and then some commands that, are, that will be mapped back into messages. Um, so that's, that's what the return value is. So here you see I'm returning two-tuples, and that seems reasonable, right, because that's the sort of thing I'm supposed to return. But when you come over here, I've got this other thing I'm doing with this, like, bang, empty list, and all that is is some shorthand. People get confused when they see it because they should. It's not like well documented often. Uh, it just says like, here's my model and also I don't want to do anything. Or here's my model and here's my list of commands. But that way you don't have to write a two tuple because it would be like three lines long if you want to follow coding standards. Anyway, so it's a silly shorthand. Um, all right, so then we have like tick sub, which is a list of subscriptions. Um, so it takes our model. It says if we're paused, then I'm not gonna like do anything when time's passing. 
but if we're not paused, then for every um, minute times the interval for the model, which is one over the beats per minute, uh, we're going to send a tick. So basically, that just sends ticks at the appropriate timing based on the BPM setting. And then when we tick, um, I don't care about the time. Like, that's what that underscore means. So the tick also gives me, like, here's the time. But I don't care about the time at all. I just care that we ticked. So I take our model and I pass it through. That's a, a pipe. You'll see these in both Elixir and Elm. And all it does is it passes, uh, in this case, the last argument uh, to that function is passed as the thing that you're piping through it. In Elixir's case, it's the first argument, but those, there's various reasons for them to be different. Um, so I have this update notes function I'm just passing through to the model. Um, and all it does is it says, hey, take the current note, increment it by one, and then modulo total notes, right? Because we want to wrap back around. Um, and then we have our command that takes our model and requests some notes to be played. And so what we do is we go through this get notes function that says, like, here's where the playhead is, what notes should be played right now based on the state of the system, and then go ahead and map that through a list of commands that ask JavaScript to play that note. Um, check note just takes the model and updates the song by updating the track with the checked slot, or whatever you checked. Um, and then it uh, actually call this check note function, which um, actually is sending stuff out over the, over the WebSocket piece, over the Phoenix channel. Um, so that's maybe moderately confusing. But uh, basically, I get my new model, and then I'm like, well, I checked the note, and here's like the new stuff, and here's what to tell people I checked. Um, similarly with set note, which sets the, the note for the track, I do the same thing. I update my model, and then I have the set note function that's just like produces the outbound message for the Phoenix channels. Uh, add track, fairly straightforward. You take the dictionary, you insert a new track with the new track ID, which will be the size of the, of the model, or the size of the song, which will be you know, n plus one of the, the length. Uh, and then we, uh, we have add track again, which does the thing. It tells the Phoenix channel, like, I've added a track. And then set editing track and choose note. Just uh, update those two bits um, for the wizard for changing stuff. So that was maybe lengthy, but like, it's a relatively complicated application. And we went through all of the things that it can do in, I don't know, five, seven minutes. So I like that. It's pretty great. Uh, I don't end up with this smooth of an architecture when I just like crap some JavaScript into an editor. Um, I guess I haven't covered everything because there's also the choose octave piece. This is the awful piece. This is actually, up till now, things were moderately OK. Like you see stuff and things seem cool. But then like when you're finished with the wizard, this is the code to um, actually change the note for a given thing. And there are ways I could have like, made, it, uh, made it smaller with, um, like you have maybe dot with default in the case of a nothing. But um, that wouldn't be the right solution. The right solution is to model the thing differently. And I'll talk about that later again. But ultimately, like we, assuming that our state was reasonable for, to, because re we could receive this choose octave me uh, message technically without having a track to, to be edited, just based on our, on our model. There's no way in the UI presently to produce those messages. But there could be. Um, and so that's sort of why this is modeled terribly. But anyway, we do end up updating it. And we tell people that we updated it. And then. When we connect to the socket, we use this Phoenix channel library to go ahead and connect to the socket, which returns us this. So we start off with this channel. So in theory, I don't have it wired up this way. But in theory, you could, um, I got, my server supports arbitrarily many songs. So like if you just looked at the URL and like took a GUID and like made it a shareable URL, then it'll support multiple songs being edited at the same time. So that's what the channel name is. It's just whatever, whatever would be after the slash, but it's hard coded in this case. Um, and then we have like an initial Phoenix socket. So the Phoenix socket in this case, that Phoenix socket in it, is just um, like data, right? It's not doing anything. It's just data. And then what we do is we pass uh, both those things through this phoenix.socket.join. So we say, take this Phoenix socket in it, which is uh, data representing a socket, and tell it to join this collusion channel. But it's not doing anything. It's just returning, well, here's what the socket's data would look like afterwards. And here's like a command that you should send back out to the runtime if you want that to happen. So I collect both of those. And then I also add this on collusion state. So like when I get a new state from the server, um, pass it through my receive state message, like, or map it through this. It's actually a function, receive state, that takes a single argument that is like the model, or the, a song, rather. And so it says, like, when that happens, given this collusion channel name, map it into receive state. And it just gets a JSON value, and we deal with it later. Um, anyway, and then we update our socket, uh, the data piece, because otherwise it would get out of sync with what it should be. And we use command.map to send out the, the messages to the runtime. And command.map says, like, there's this Phoenix piece that knows how to deal with all these messages that I don't know how to deal with. They're, like, sort of opaque to me. 
And so all I do is I map them into a, uh, my message type, which is Phoenix message, and I just hand them over to that update function when I get them, and it'll take care of like making stuff good. And I don't have to think about it. And there's a lot of stuff that works this way. Anyway, when I do receive a state, I decode it with a song decoder, and if there was an error decoding the song, then I just like don't do anything, but I happen to print something out of the console. But if there was an error de decoding the song, I replace our song entirely with it. So like my entire collaboration strategy at this point is throw away all of our local song and replace it with this new one anytime we get a new one. And for a small number of people, this is fine. Um, but the point is I thought about it. Uh, anyway. And so when we get the Phoenix message thing, we just pass it through to this phoenix.socket.update, and whatever it gives us back, we replace as our socket data. And then we send out any commands that it told us that we should send. And again, we map them back so that when the command comes back, it's sort of wrapped by our Phoenix message type so that we know to send it back to this component. Um, this is perhaps like maybe confusing if it's the first element we've seen, but it's not, uh, it's not confusing in practice. Anyway, so that's all the update stuff. Um, and we covered all kinds of stuff there between using an external UI library that kept internal state to using like this Phoenix thing that keeps internal state to deal with Phoenix to doing all of our stuff to doing setup for music. So there was a whole bunch of stuff that was happening, um, but it ended up being like five pages of code and all of the things were like two, three lines, right? So uh, with the exception of that one terrible one. Um, anyway, so let's look at the view. All the view does, again, is take your model and produce HTML that can produce messages. And so uh, here we have view body, which is the core of it. And it takes our model. I'm using this Elm CSS thing to produce some styles. That's not hugely important. It's just a few minor things. So I send those in just into the DOM there with a style node uh, just so they'll apply. You can sort of see here how um, you see div, and then you have a list of things. That's a list of uh, attributes. And then you have another list of things, and that's a list of children. That's how all of the HTML stuff works in Elm. Um, and then we have five pieces that I've broken off into functions of their own. View metadata, view top controls, view song editor, view dialogue, and view connection. And so this is how they map to the actual UI that you saw a second ago. So that top bit's the metadata, then we have the top controls, the song editor, the, uh, the dialogue you don't see unless it's being shown, and then the view connection button. And so I just wanted to walk through those. So this is all that is, right? I have the current note and I show the model's current note as a string. I have paused whether or not it's paused and I just turn that into a string. So that's straightforward enough. The top controls, this BPM, and I've actually modified this a little bit in the demo that I'll be showing you, but in general, we have like this pause button and then we have this thing to, to edit the BPM. And it's a little bit convoluted, honestly, the button.renderMDL bit. Uh, this is because of the way that uh, this material design library I use works. Uh, it's not hard to use, but it's definitely not the best thing to show someone who hasn't seen, seen Elm before and be like, look how easy this is, because it's a little bit more complicated than it should be. Um, anyway, but it also like, is really nice. Uh, so again, on that text field, so a button.onclick emits a toggle paused message, right? Um, and then, is there like a laser? One would assume, but whatever. There we go. And then uh, on input, uh, we set BPM, we parse this string as an integer, and then like if it was an invalid string, like you entered the word, I don't know, tofu, that's not a number, right? So then it turns it into 128. So if it doesn't parse an integer, it turns it into 128, then it passes that through to set BPM, and that's the message that gets emitted anytime you change the, the input. And then the song editor itself, we have track rows. So what I do here is I take the song, which again is a dictionary of tracks, and I fold them through this function with, I start off with like this empty list because these are gonna be the children of, of uh, this table. So start off here. I fold the dictionary of tracks through, and I take the accumulator, which starts off as this, and then I add on a list that has that's the result of the view track function with the model, the track ID, and the track. And then the fold is going to get the track ID, the track, and the accumulator because I'm folding through a dictionary, right? So this is the key, this is the value, this is the accumulator. Anyway, so that's how that works. And then I basically have this table and I just show the track rows as its children. So that's like all of these are just that one tiny like value. And then I have the add track button that emits an add track uh, function or message. And then viewing a single track, which is the function that we mapped over here, right? We kind of uh, pretended this existed. Well, here it is. So it gets the model, it gets the track ID, and it gets the track data and produces HTML. And so we have, like we take the track slots, we turn them into a list, we map that list over view track cell, which is this fun uh, function we'll see in a second. We tell it what the current node is because it needs to be able to draw this black line if it is the current node. And we tell it what track ID it's dealing with. 
And so then we like add all of those track cells we add after this one initial TD, which is the view track metadata, which is where you change the, that thing. Um, and the reason I'm going through all this is just to show you like it's a relatively complicated application, but it's pretty understandable in all of its small parts. And that's kind of a thing that always happens with Elm. It's very easy to understand in the small. Uh, viewing a track cell, so that's what one of these little squares is. Uh, basically, we have some more styles, right? The current note, if it's the current note. So this class list will apply whatever this class is if this is true, and it won't if it's false. So it'll be checked if it's on, and it'll be current note if it's current note. So if it's current note, it'll have that black bar on the right, and if it's checked, it'll be red. Um, and then it's just a checkbox that I've styled a particular way, and then I say whether or not it's checked, and then when you click it, it'll get checked, obviously, and when you check it, it's going to emit this check note that knows the track ID and the slot ID that you just checked. So that gets routed back up through our update function, and we deal with it. Uh, viewing the track metadata, we have this like MIDI table, and we like basically figure out what model, what uh, note you're showing, and we show that as text. And then when you click it, it's going to start. It's going to set editing track, which will tell trigger the dialog to show. This is the dialog bit. So if the track is, if there's no track being edited, then like the dialog would show this about function, but you actually don't ever open the dialog without that anyway, so you no one ever sees that. But if there is a track ID, then when you show the dialog, it'll view the note, the track note chooser. And then this is the track note chooser, right? It says, like, pick the note. And so if you've chosen a note, then you'll pick an octave next. But if you haven't chosen a note, then you'll pick a note. And so that's how these two things happen. And then finally, when you um, pick the note, we will uh, just, like, emit that message wherever it is. But, uh, ch -ch 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 uh, close on, click. That's the close. Pick the note. Oh, the note buttons themselves have that. Sorry. Um, they're right over here. Uh, no, I don't show them. Anyway, the note buttons know what messages to emit. And Octave Dialog looks the same. This is terrible. Uh, anyway, and then we have this view connection, right? So if you're connected, then it doesn't show anything. It shows an empty div. But if you're not connected, it says, hey, click this. I'll connect the socket. And that'll talk to the Phoenix piece. So that's the whole of the Elm application. It was a long discussion, but you've seen a giant Elm app. Well, giant. You've seen a relatively complex Elm application now. So then we have the, the Phoenix side of things. And so I wanted to start off with, like, um, a preface. I'm kind of dumb. I used to think I was smart, but then it turns out no. Um, so I'm going to show you why that is. Uh, I'm always telling people, like, in the Rails community or, or elsewhere, like, Rails is not your app. Phoenix is not your app, right? I've mentioned it earlier, right? It's just this wrapper around your app. So, uh, the, so people do things like they pick a database before they have written any line of code. Like, that seems dumb to me. I don't think you need persistence yet. You don't have anything. Um, anyway, so imagine my dismay because I found myself doing this. And these are Phoenix generators. But basically, I just generated a model which already says, like, we're going to store this thing in the database. We're going to have some tracks. I don't need a relational model for this. This is a song. Like, I don't need to do any joins. I don't need to do any analysis of this. It's a freaking song. Um, and so I started off here, and uh, this was dumb. And I ultimately realized it was dumb because I tell other people that it's dumb. And so this commit existed, but I very quickly got rid of it. Um, my point, though, is the song is just this giant blob. It's not relational data, so why was I using a relational database? Um, I killed this with fire, and I replaced it with this. So this is an umbrella app. It has two pieces. It has collusions, which is the part that deals with these collaborative songs existing conceptually. And then we have the web piece, which is like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I could interact with them from the web? Um, so these are both OTP applications, if you, know what, uh, if you know what those are. But basically, they're these separate applications you can start, and they happen to interact with each other. Um, Anyway, so we have an OTP app that runs some gen servers to manage state. I'm going to go through this part fairly quickly. Uh, but this is the exact same state as before, just I ported it very mechanically from Elm to Elixir. Uh, I'm going to build a thing that can do this uh, automatically, but there's not yet uh, extant software that gives you the uh, abstract syntax tree for Elm code. Uh, so I did this by hand. Uh, this is all it looks like. Um, if you squint, it looks the same. So we have a song. It has this like dictionary of tracks. We have two initial tracks, right? You've seen this before. There's that um, initial slot, note 69, and then we create 20 of them, right? Again, this is our sort of update function. No, uh, we can zoom in. And it's a normal gen server. And if you look, basically we say, okay, like, so where's the song that you're trying to talk about? So I say start link and I give you a name. And if it doesn't exist, then we start one. If it does exist, then we just return whatever it was and pretend like we started it. Um, here's our server. And so this is just like the, the um, the gen server. So you can ask it what tracks there are. You can ask how many there are. You can ask for the total slots. And you can get the value of a given slot. It's fairly straightforward stuff. And these are, all these are doing is just calling out. So this is the public API. And the way this works is you have your process that's running somewhere else. And then this is like the functions that you call. And they use genserver.call to talk to your process and get data back. So the actual implementations of those on the, um, 
the server side, well, we're still not there, sorry. These are, this is more of the public API. So you can like set a slot, set a note, add a track, get the state. Get the state is, uh, we use that a lot. And so this is the implementation of all of that. It's not that exciting. You basically are just doing the same thing we saw on the Elm side, just with these Elixir data structures. Uh, they're almost, you know, all of the things you can do to modify the song exist in both places. Um, and so then, let's see here. Uh, yeah, so this is just a little bit more that didn't fit on that, I guess. Um, so it's somewhat lengthy, but it really is everything we do for the whole song. So like, it's like maybe three pages of code at most if you have a big font. So it's not crazy for like a collaborative song tool. And so then this is, uh, we have the gen server. We'd like to be able to modify it when you make changes in your own application. So we want changes that you make in the UI to like change this thing that's running somewhere. But of course it's not running in a web server yet. So what we want to do is we want to wrap it um, with channels. And so this is the general idea. These provide an interface to send messages in from the web piece. Um, so this is a quick channel that lets us send messages. Um, I have this kind of refresh rate where I send the state regardless, uh, like I send it every second regardless. I don't have to do that part. I just happen to. It's dumb, and you shouldn't do it if you're doing this. Uh, anyway, so when someone joins a channel, it basically says, uh, you know, they join collusion colon some name. Foobar is the, the default one. And what it'll do is it'll start a, a collusion or start one of these songs uh, with the ID foobar. And if it's already running, it'll just get the running one back. So if someone's already connected to it, it gets their, you know, they're both working on the same state now. But if they're not, it'll start a new one. And then it'll send this push state message to itself. So that's just so that it can finish this function and like come back to handling the next message, which is the piece to push the state. And then we return its state. And its state is, uh, we take its, the socket, we assign, uh, that's not really the state, but anyway, we assign the ID and the process ID into the socket just so we can look them up easier later. Um, these are just kind of some local uh, stuff, you can, places you can store stuff. When someone sends us a track ad, we send in collusion server ad track, and then we tell everybody about it, broadcast state, and then we reply, cool, and we update our socket. We didn't change anything, but we return our socket as the new socket. Uh, when somebody checks a note, again, we just defer to this function that knows how to check the note. We tell everybody about it, and then we say okay. Uh, similarly, they set a note, same deal. I mean, we're just calling a function to do a thing, telling everybody else how it happened, and then we're done. And you could do more interesting stuff than just broadcast the state. You could like specifically send this note was checked, but it's really easy like with the few number of people that make sense in one of these things to just tell everybody like, here's the whole new state right now. Um, but you can be, sm the point is, that's where you would be smarter if you wanted to make a smarter server. Um, and then push state, basically every refresh rate seconds, every second, we push the state to everybody regardless of whether somebody's doing anything just in case something went wrong. And this is where I was being overly defensive. Uh, I didn't need to do it. It definitely does not cause a problem. Uh, and then broadcast state just uh, tells every, you know, this is the function that tells everybody what the state is. So that's like the whole everything. So this, on the one hand, it was kind of deep. On the other hand, it's really kind of cool app. And I don't know, we looked at maybe eight pages of code. So not that much. Um, so here, this should work. You have a laptop out. Uh, anybody that has a laptop out, visit that. Uh, you can pull it up on the phone. I have not taken any efforts to make it nice, and it's a table, so it should work, but I doubt you're going to have the best of times. And so then let me uh, get out of here. Let me make this. Uh, no, I already have that. Okay, so I'm going to refresh, and we should all be on the same thing. Uh, part, uh, sorry, one second. That. Uh, you can't see it. One second. That. That's bit.ly slash elm dash colluder. It's running so slow. I'm going to take that off just so I can increase the beats per minute. Also, it runs at a... Uh, because it didn't have uh, focus, the browser was not, like, preferring it. So it was, uh, it was running slower than it should anyway. Let me move this over there. So... You should be able to go there and change this song. I'm not going to touch anything. So if you were able to go to, uh, yeah, so let me change that URL to like the, the nicer URL to type, bit.ly slash home dash polluter. Now you will be running at a different beats per minute. That's not synchronized between them. The song itself is synchronized. Did you give up? It doesn't show the, the song part. There's no reason for that. 
Oh, but that's because you had to click connect to back end. You have to click a button to tell it's actually connected to the back end, sorry. So someone's doing something, I see. And actually, this part down here was contributed by uh, someone from the old community who just wanted to do this. But it's kind of neat. Anyway. So this is the thing. It's not a crazy amount of code, and it's nice, and it's not like, uh, it's not magical at all. Um, and I can make the whole writing of the elixir part go away just by writing a tiny piece of code that will build this sort of generalizable um, channel abstraction for sure. Um, you wouldn't want to use it forever, but it would get you up and going pretty easily. I feel like this is like uh, the part where we have a uh, like a crazy serial killer on the list. <laughs> anyway, so that is that is the the whole of the thing that I built. But I wanted to go through just sort of how nicely it was to how nice it was to do that sort of thing in in Elm and Elixir. And again, like I could have done this in a couple of hours, not like tooting my own horn here. It's just like it's not actually complicated. It's complicated if it's the first time you're seeing both Elm and Elixir at the same time for sure. Um, anyway, but uh, I mentioned a few things about how this was dumb, and I think I have like ten minutes left. First off, does anybody have any questions? Because otherwise, I'll end up burning too much time with this next piece. All right, so I'll talk through how this is dumb. Um, so there's this thing like making invalid things unrepresentable or make impossible states impossible, um, this concept. And this is where I failed at that. So I have in my model, I had this track being edited. It's a maybe integer, and I had the chosen note, which is a maybe string. But what these are representing is conceptually like a three-step flow through uh, sort of a wizard. So I could have modeled these as a union type where like the first one was uh, not editing. And the second one was editing track integer. And the third one was editing track integer with no note. And the fourth one would have been like non-existent, right? Because that's actually another message that I meant. But the point is, then I would have had a union type. I would have had only a single value to cover this. And I wouldn't be dealing with like this, um, essentially this matrix of like all the possible maybe states. Because these are really, these are the same thing. They're like parts of the same idea, but I'm tracking them separately. Um, because like because I'm using them as maybes, I have this awful like waterfall of of badness where I have to check to see like is it a nothing, is it a just thing, um, and so like this is how I could have modeled it, right? A note chooser wizard would be pending. You would have track being edited int, and you would have chosen note where you have the track that's already being edit, uh, edited. You know about that, and the string which is the note you chose, um, and then I could have tracked it as a single thing in my model, and then I would have just started out in, in the pending state. So the point is anywhere anywhere you have and this, you know, whether you're in your Elm or, or Haskell or any, anything where you have multiple bits of data that are like maybes but are used in conjunction with each other, uh, you really have something like this almost certainly. You have, like, you can model it instead like this, and then you can, I would never have this code, right? This code is, the only reason this code is awful is because I didn't encode it properly. Now the code would be like, are we pending? Then we do this. Are we editing a track? Then we do this. Are we choosing a note? We do this. And here we like have to kind of derive that based on the state of these maybes. Um, so the point is the code would be like two lines of code instead of uh, 18 here, I don't know, 12. Um, so it would look like this, right? Set editing track uh, would set it to track being edited. Choose note would say, look, if we are in the track being edited state, then we do something. Otherwise, we don't do anything. Um, anyway, so the, this code is obviously, I think everyone will agree that this code is simpler than this code. Uh, maybe not simpler. Quicker to read, minimum. Um, anyway, so that's just the point I wanted to make about um, making impossible states impossible, right? You can, if you take the time to encode things into your types, then you can build better code faster that's like easier to read and says more about what it is, right? It wasn't a maybe chosen note. It wasn't like those two things. It, the, the idea was like, we have a wizard. It has this state, has this trans, like very ordered steps. And so instead of making people like figure that out in their head by reading the code and being like, oh, this is how we use these two maybes together. We well, can just say it. This is a wizard. Here are the states it has. Um, anyway, 
So that's all I have. Uh, thanks for listening. And if you don't get anything else out of this, uh, I'd love to convince you to play with either Phoenix or Elm and ideally them together. Um, anyway, thanks. <laughs>